Hi, welcome to the Nurture Nature Show. I am the Reverend Dr. Laura Kim Joyner of One Earth Conservation and Ministry. I serve as wildlife veterinarian and Unitarian Universalist minister. During our time together, we will have a chance to nurture ourselves so that we can nurture all of nature. Welcome into this community of hope and nourishment and solidarity with all of life. Today's theme is parakeets and paracletes. Through these two examples, which you'll learn more about later, I'm going to ask you to reflect on these two questions. What does your heart yearn to share? How could you and the many others be healed if you speak the truth? So let us begin today with these words from W.S. Wurendra. I hear a voice, the cry of a wounded animal. Someone shoots an arrow at the moon. A small bird has fallen from the nest. People must be awakened. Witness must be given so that life can be guarded. And so we gather here today to awake to life's possibilities, to give witness to truth, so that life may be guarded. Now I'd like to share with you a story of liberation and freedom that comes from speaking and hearing the truth. Once upon a time, there was a sailor by the name of Robinson Crusoe. Maybe you heard of him. He was on a ship when a great storm came up and the ship wrecked and threw him onto the island. He was the only one to survive. This island that he landed on was so beautiful. And what kinds of things are on a beautiful island? Well, yes, flowers and tropical fish and birds, especially parrots with bright feathers that flew all over the island. But Robinson Crusoe didn't think any of it was beautiful. He could only think about how lonely and afraid he was. He kept saying, Poor Robinson Crusoe, why are you so sad? How did you get to be here? He wanted company so bad that he tried to capture a wild parrot, and he was finally able to do so by throwing a stick at a young parrot in the tree. It fell to the ground and he brought it home. Now, that's not a very nice way to treat a wild parrot. The parrot survived, so did Robinson Crusoe, and he made a cage for it, or he tied it to a perch, and he waited for the parrot to speak to him. Eventually, the parrot did learn to speak a few words, and you know what the parrot said? Well, it was just what Robinson Crusoe always said. Poor Robinson Crusoe, how did you get to be here? Why are you so sad? One day, Crusoe was out on the ocean in a small canoe, and he was trying to escape the island, but the boat sank. He had to swim all the way back to his shipwrecked island. When he got to the beach, he collapsed, and he fell asleep. He woke up a few hours later because he heard someone saying, Poor Robinson Crusoe, how did you get here? Why are you so sad? It was Pole, the parrot he had captured, had gotten loose from his cage somehow and had come looking for Robinson Crusoe. Robinson Crusoe was so glad for the parrot's company after he'd been so scared. He began to change, Robinson Crusoe did. He no longer kept Pole in a cage or captured any other wild parrots to teach them English, for he could now understand the talk of wild parrots. They were telling him with all their squawking and squirps and squeaks and with their bright feathers that they were beautiful. And this made Robinson Crusoe feel better. 
he knew he wasn't alone. He became happy because the parents weren't saying poor Robinson Crusoe, but happy, blessed, lucky Robinson Crusoe, which he was because he was so grateful for the wild parrots that kept him company. Eventually, Robinson Crusoe did escape the island, and everywhere he went, he told people how precious birds are and how it isn't good to capture them or hurt them. But our role was just to listen to them and love them for their wild selves. Just as we are here, us today, on this earth to love the wild beauty of each other here. May it be so. Our times, though, are not always easy. We are uneasy. Have you ever been anxious so much that you couldn't sleep at night? And maybe you were looking for a solution to some problem, and every once in a while a solution would come to you in a dream? I had one of those dreams one time. I was trying to discover an important truth that would bring peace to this world and help build a beloved community. And I was tossing and turning and trying to think it through. And near dawn, the answer finally came in a flash. And the answer was parakeets and paracletes. When I was sort of awake, I wondered, perhaps like you are now, what do birds have to do with paracletes? But then I remembered that parakeets are not just any birds, and paracletes does not refer to athletic footwear. You see, parakeets are a type of parrot very special because they are different from all others by having a hooked and very strong bill. Paraclete is the Greek word for advocate, comforter, counselor, and it's found in several verses in John of the Christian scriptures. Let me read a few of them. God will give you another paraclete to be with you forever. This is the spirit of truth. You know her because she abides with you and she will be in you. When the paraclete comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears. Scholars believe that the author of John is writing in hopes that Jesus will live on as the spirit of truth in us and in all of life, including parakeets. Well, how can parakeets tell us of the truth? They have biology and brains, and they're all so different from us. Nevertheless, parrots have a remarkable ability to communicate with us. Some species have a vocabulary up to a thousand words, Others, like Alex, the gray, African gray parrot, can speak in whole sentences, and they have the intelligence of a child of five to six years of age. One time, in a veterinary medical symposium, I was teaching about parrots to a group of veterinarians, and I asked them to ponder this question. Why is it that parrots are so colorful? They like to be touched, and they allow us to do it. They're very sociable and they mimic our speech. I mean, all of these traits maybe come through evolution, but they are at peril to the parrot because all those reasons makes us want them. And so we bring them in from captivity and the illegal wildlife trade and they're going extinct. So why do all these traits come together in one very spectacular animal? And one veterinarian in the back, she raised her hand and said, maybe it's just a gift. Now she didn't say whether the gift was from God or from evolution or both, but she was speaking about the truth of these birds and what they tell her, that it's a very welcome message of interconnection, of beauty, and of wonder. She had heard the truth. But parrots don't always tell us things that we would like to hear. One day, a man was given a, a parrot for his birthday. The parrot could really talk, but every other word was a foul word. And if not speaking crudely, the bird was just plain old rude. 
The man didn't like listening to this rude and crude parrot, so he tried to teach him some more polite words. It didn't work. He yelled at the bird, and that didn't work either because parrots like loud noises. Finally, in a moment of desperation, the man put the parrot in a freezer. For a few moments, he heard the bird squawking and kicking and screaming, and, and then suddenly all was quiet. The man was afraid that the bird had been hurt, so he quickly opened the freezer door, and the parrot calmly stepped out onto the man's hand and said, I'm sorry that I might have offended you with the language and action, and I ask your forgiveness. And the parrot then asked, may I ask what the turkey did? Parrots today might ask a similar question. What did they do to deserve extinction at our hands? Their ghosts fly overhead, plaintively crying, how did we get to be here? Why are we so sad? Some therapists say that there's a general sadness and desperation that undercuts all our lives. And as we witness the steady decline of biodiversity at our own hands, and if we wish happiness, we must address the age-old injury our culture and beings have suffered. For our sakes, as well as the parakeets in the world they used to fly over, we must listen to what the parakeets tell us and be paracletes, be advocates, be the bearers of truth. We must do this because injustice is not a thing of the past. The loss of the parakeets, just as the many other kinds of losses in our lives, lives with us today in grief. Somebody wrote recently, the Carolina parakeet last seen in 1904 is now extinct. My grandfather was part of the last birding expedition which searched for it. They failed to find it. I mourn. I mourn too, not just for the birds or for myself, but for all of those who will never have parrots or parakeets in their own backyard and who are losing their parrots today. I work in Latin America as a wildlife veterinarian and am witness to the countless suffering of parrots torn from their wild families, treated like they were nothing, and then imprisoned for the rest of their lives. The next generation of children will not know rainbow beauty or intelligence chattering above them in trees. They and their world will be diminished as we take these birds, like this cockatoo here from the wild, capture, restrain, and imprison, treat terribly, so that we can have beauty closer to us. In hearing their truth, in facing both the tragic and the glorious, we grasp our responsibility at the same time we find the courage to answer the cries of the dying and the suffering. In the movie, The Thin Red Line, it's a movie about the war in the Pacific where gunfire and bombs killed not only people, but it ravaged the landscape and the nest trees where the wild parrots were. And in the scenery, the hero heard the truth of the birds. He looked down and saw one of those baby parrots that had been bombed out of a tree and the parrot was dying and he said, one man looks at a dying bird and thinks there's nothing but unanswerable pain. Another man sees that same bird and feels the glory, feels something smiling through it. The Carolina parakeet is no more, but parrots give us much to smile about. For they herald divine possibilities as did the parrot who shouted, Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming, when a burglar tried to break into his house. The startled thief went and hid and said, well, wait a minute, I know nobody's home. And so he went back into the house and he saw it was just a parrot talking. And so he went up to the parrot, he's all relaxed now, and he says, parrot, what's your name? Moses, answered the parrot. M Moses, what kind of parrot? A people would name their parrot Moses. And the parrot answered, I guess the same kind of people that would name their Wattweiler Jesus. 
this particular parrot, Moses, did not exist. But there is a Moses that is real. And he is also a parrot that spoke of sacred possibilities. When working in Guatemala on parrot conservation, I knew him by the Spanish version of his name, Moises. The Guatemalans with whom I worked named him Moises, or Moses, because he was astounding and was a prophet who blessed us with the spirit of truth. He came into our lives one morning during our monitoring of wild parrot nests, most of which were poached or were destroyed. For three straight days, we've been watching one particular nest with still two eggs in it, but the parents had not entered once in three days. I'm telling you, as a veterinarian, no eggs could survive unincubated for that long. So we climbed the tree and we lowered the eggs to the ground and the eggs looked dead to me. So I put them in a closed container in our black Jeep, rolled up the windows and left them there for several hours in the middle of the day while we went to go climb a couple more parrot trees. Nothing could have survived in that car. Afterwards, I drove the Jeep fast along a rough dirt road because we were hungry and it was time to go home, bouncing and bumping the eggs on the floor before I remembered that there were eggs, you know, in, in this special sack, and I asked someone to hold them on their lap. When we got to the Avery, where the laboratory was, I had better equipment to look at the eggs. And so I turned off the lights and I shined a bright light, and I saw the shadow of a beak move inside one of the eggs. It was alive. Miraculously, one chick was still alive. I put the egg in our incubator, and a week later, the chick hatched. I wasn't sure he was going to survive his first day. But when on the second day he chirped, I heard in that sound the wonder of life, and that he could survive. And he did. And his species would survive if we could just give them a chance. We must take in their truth to give these species a chance and then to tell others, as Moses the parrot here told us. It is not easy to testify to the whole truth because we have inherited stories for millennia of cultural influences which warp the truth. We might say that parakeets do not have inherent dignity and worth and feel pain and then shoot them for sport or for their feathers, condemning them to extinction. In a similar way, we might say that Africans are uncivilized and then take them for slaves or accept their modern urban and drug-related imprisonment as unavoidable. We might also say that gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, queer people are different than heterosexuals and sentence them to death caused by our own hands or deny them the hope to flourish in loving relationships. We might also say that progress is the goal of humankind and good fortune for only those with proper documents and ignore the ravished land and those changed to the manacles of economic injustice while we bask in good fortune. We might say that life is a continual struggle for safety and perfection and throw ourselves into the dungeons of individualism where we torture ourselves with false dreams. We might say and do all these things, but we don't have to, nor should we. We must be awakened. Witness must be given so that life can be guarded. In the movie Pauly, a man and a parrot witness to one another. Did you all see this movie? It's about a talking parrot that got separated from his owner, a little girl. For years and years, the bird kept looking for his little girl until finally, Polly ended up in the basement of a research lab in a small cage. He no longer risked talking or flying because it only got him in trouble. So he'd been placed in this basement because of his refusal to give people what they wanted. He was afraid to speak. One day, Polly was discovered by a janitor, a lonely man from Russia who had only known tragedy and oppression all his life. He too had learned to be silent 
to not speak. So when he first met Polly, he started talking to Polly. And eventually, over time, they began to trust one another. And they both began to speak and tell each other their stories. So moved was this man that he decided he was going to find the little girl that Polly had lost. And so he went searching and searching, and he found her, and he broke Polly out of his cage, and he took Polly from that basement, and they went and they knocked on the door of the house. And it wasn't a little girl who answered, it was a grown-up woman, but it was Polly's little girl. And Polly did not want to speak. He did not want to fly. He just wanted to give up and leave. And then the woman began to sing to him, to tell him of beauty of their past relationship. And all of a sudden, Polly was liberated. And he started to talk, and he flew around, joyfully gigging to land on her shoulder. And the woman looked up at the janitor and said, won't you please come in and spend some time with us? And the janitor said, no, 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 I, I really have to go. And he turned to go, so careful he was he, so guarded was he. And Polly shouted at him, stop, what are you doing? Don't be afraid to speak. And the man heard that wisdom and he turned around and he told the woman, he said, yes, I would very much like to share some time with you. Polly and the man together had learned how to be in relationship and how to speak the truth. Let us be like the janitor in the story and listen to the birds so that we might not only free them, but ourselves. They who bind to themselves a joy do the winged life destroy. But they who kiss the joy as it flies live in eternity's sunrise. There are smiles telling through the stories of all our lives, even those that speak of tragedy, loss, pain, and our own privilege. Let us give witness to one another so that in telling the story we may feel the glory and give rise to the hope of freedom. And let us pray. We pray to the birds. We pray to the birds because we believe that they will carry the messages of our hearts forward. We pray to them because we believe in their existence, the way their songs begin and end each day, their invocations and benedictions of earth. We pray to the birds because they remind us of what we love rather than what we fear. And at the end of our prayers, they teach us how to listen to truth. How can truth set you and the many others free? I have spoken today, and now it's your turn to speak, to listen, to reflect, to experience, and live your own truth. So in a little bit, you'll see some reflection questions and some suggestions for action. Think about those. Share your reflections with others or with me. You can email me. And if you'd like to know more about how to nurture yourself so as to nurture all of nature so that you can speak up, you can watch other shows of this Nurture Nature series. You can also go to the website, oneearthconservation.org, where we explain about Nurture Nature workshops and that program, and you can get involved with that, host one or attend one. You can also join meetup groups. And all of these connections and websites will follow the reflection questions and suggested actions. So until we meet up again, go in peace and love taking with you the light of our shared time together.